Thank you very much, Carol, for that very kind uh, in introduction. So, um, like any, I, I first of all very honored to be invited to give this lecture. I actually declined the initial invitation because I didn't think I was the intellectual equal of the people who preceded me in this. And then I thought about it for a little while and realized that this was an opportunity that I really shouldn't pass up. I have the same passion for my subject Tom Noseworthy has for his. <laughs> And it's a great honor to be asked to speak at the Paul Armstrong Lecture, because I'm in awe of all that he has accomplished over the years. So like any good clinical lecture, I'm going to start with a case history, because I want to use the information in the case history to reflect on some of the issues that I'm going to talk about. So this is a 52-year-old female with fatigue and weight loss. She's diagnosed after appropriate workup with hepatitis C. She's treated with Harvoni for 12 weeks with complete viral response, and I'll talk further about that in a minute. Her past history of that of Crohn's disease for 14 years. She was initially treated with prednisone and azothioprine, or Imuran, but that produced severe neutropenia, relevant for our discussion in a minute, and then tr transferred to infliximab or Remicade with a good, viral or with a good uh, clinical response. And subsequently, she ended up having to have surgery for fistula, and she, her pain was treated with codeine, and she got no pain relief. And the sad result of that was that her, she was labeled as a drug seeker. So we're in an era of precision medicine, and I think this case exemplifies that beautifully, and i just like to take you through it in a little more detail. So the promise of contemporary therapeutics are that we have specific targeted therapy, we have an ability to predict side effects, and I'll demonstrate that in a minute. We have an ability to predict response, and again, I'll illustrate that in a minute, and we have some highly effective treatments, which we have never had before. So let's talk about some of these drugs. It's a molecule, drugs are a molecule that enables a therapeutic change in human physiology. Until about 20 years ago, all of drugs were small molecules of the type that Marty showed us in his particular presentation. And then the era of proteins uh, entered into therapeutics, and we're still coming to grips with that. These were developed using recombinant DNA technology. They include growth factors, cytokines, monoclonal antibodies. The most common are the monoclonal antibodies directed against tumor necrosis factor, and one of the examples of those is infliximab. Monoclonal antibodies have now been approved for 33 targets for 37 distinct diseases, including 27 for cancer. And infliximab is a chimeric monoclonal antibody used for inflammatory bowel disease and inflammatory arthritis. Now, this is what monoclonal antibodies look like. They are, um, let's make sure I get this, yes, thank you. They are constant regions here, variable regions here, a light chain and a heavy chain, and they're joined together by disulfide bonds. Now, they can come as mouse monoclonal antibodies, which you see here, and they end with the name OMAB. They can be chimeric, half mouse, half human, and they end up with the name Iximab, and Infliximab is one of those. They can be humanized, and they end up with the name Zumab, and Trastuzumab, or Herceptin, used in breast cancer, is an example of one of those. Or they can be fully human, and they end up with the name Umab, and Ustinicumab, which is just been, about two years ago, was released for the treatment of psoriasis, is an example of that. And the reason that this is important is because, obviously, immunogenicity becomes lower as the antibody becomes more humanized. Let's move on now to the contributions of pharmacogenetics to our understanding of therapies. And to do that, we need to have an understanding of the processes of drug metabolism. Drug metabolism occurs in two phases, phase one and phase two. Phase one is mediated by a superfamily of enzymes called the cytochromes. Uh, m the amount of drug metabolism by each of the cytochrome is indicated by the quantity of the size of the circle. So C3A4, 5, for example, is the most common. Um, most of these are located in the liver, but they're also present in other parts of the body, and cytochrome 3A4, 5, for example, is in the GI mucosa. 
They have, they demonstrate large inter-individual variability because of uh, genetic polymorphisms and differences in gene regulation, and I'll show you some examples of that in just a minute. And the ones that are important for humans are the 2C, the 2D, and the 3A45. The second phase of drug metabolism is one of conjugation, and again, most of the time, this results in inactivation of the drug, but there are occasions, and morphine is a classic example of that, where its glucuronidated version is actually more active than the parent compound. In our next discussion, we're going to spend a little time on this tiny little red triangle, which is thiopurine methyltransferase. The father of pharmacogenetics, in my estimation, is Dr. Richard or Dick Weinschelbaum at the Mayo Clinic, and about 30 years ago, he was the first one to demonstrate such an example of a polymorphism that had an impact on drug therapy. And this was done in conjunction with the metabolism of the thiopurines, of which 6-mercaptopurine, which is used in childhood leukemia, is one example, and azothioprine, which is the one that was used in the treatment of this patient, is another example. And basically, this is a two-step metabolic pathway with thiopurine methyltransferase and xanthine oxidase. Now, this is a nice stable enzyme, but thiopurine methyltransferase comes both in, in, in basically in two different variants, three actually, homozygote for low activity, het homozygote for very high activity, and then heterozygote for the middle of the road. And this enzyme is very critical because azothioprine and 6-mercaptopurine, for example, can cause very severe neutropenia. It's likely that our patient was in this category. She was a very low metabolizer of azathioprine, and that's why she developed um, the neutropenia. Uh, the other end of the spectrum is an individual who's a very high metabolizer, and this individual needs considerably larger doses of azathioprine to get the desired therapeutic effect. So this is one of the oldest examples of pharmacogenetics, and it's a very important one. The FDA currently has a statement in the, the um, monograph for azothioprine. It is highly recommended, not mandatory, it's mandatory for some of the other pharmacogenetic mechanisms, but highly recommended that TPMT be measured in advance of prescribing thiopurines such as azothioprine. Now let's talk about codeine. Remember, the patient didn't get any response. Well, codeine is not active. It's a completely inert drug. It has to be converted to morphine in order to produce a therapeutic effect. 10% of Caucasians have an inactive polymorphism and can't convert. And that's what this patient was. Now, does that mean you have to measure it? No, it just simply means if they don't get a response, try something else. They just can't make the active ingredient. A very small percentage are hypermetabolizers, and this produces hypersensitivity to codeine, and these people actually become comatose when treated with codeine. And there is considerable ethnic variation. We know, for example, that the Chinese population are very likely to have reduced amounts of morphine in their system. So this is an example of a very common drug for which there is actually a pharmacogenetic mechanism that could be used if a patient fails to respond. Now, if you're interested in pursuing the pharmacogenetic issue a little bit further, um, there are, are a number of locations in which the ability to measure these things are present. But there are two major research networks which are important. There's the, oh, sorry. There's the Canadian Pharmacogenetics Network for Drug Safety, which is based at UBC, Western, uh, CHEO, Toronto, Edmonton, Winnipeg, and Montreal. And in the U US, a much more robust and much longer living, <coughs> excuse me, research network is the pharmacogenomics research network based at the University of Michigan, Ohio State, University of Maryland, Florida, St. Jude's Children's Hospital, Vanderbilt, Stanford, and Mayo Clinic. And I would argue that the most successful of these are total, uh, of, for totally integrating them into clinical care are the Mayo Clinic, not surprisingly, that's where Dr. Weishenbaum is, and Vanderbilt University. And if you're interested in pursuing this at all, there's a huge availability of information resources at this particular website. 
Finally, let's talk about Harvoni, which was the drug that made such a tremendous difference to the management of this patient's hepatitis C. It's the, uh, an oral drug very effective in the treatment of hepatitis C genotype 1, which is the particular variant that we have in Canada. It's a combination of two different drugs, neither of which I can pronounce properly, except to say that there are a hepatitis, v, a hepatitis C polymerase inhibitor with a high barrier to resistance and a, one that targets a specific protein in hepatitis C. This drug has really been transformational. It's effective in patients naive to treatment, resistant to previous treatment, and those with cirrhosis with a cure rate of over 90%. In fact, more recent studies suggest it's close between 95 and 100%. It has very minimal side effects. <clears throat> so it's an example of a highly effective treatment that has never been available before. We'll come back to review these drugs a little bit later in the, the talk, but if you could fix this case in your mind, it will help you with some of the rest of the understanding, uh, the, the presentation. So the promise of contemporary therapeutics are that we have these very specific targeted therapies. We have an ability to predict side effects, such as neutropenia with azathioprine. We have an ability to predict response, such as pain relief with codeine, and we have some highly effective treatments. So let's move to the perils. And I've concentrated a little longer on the perils than I have on the promise, but I'll bring the promise back in. In clinical pharmacology, we tend to think of drugs along a continuum or a paradigm. Discovery, whoopsies. Discovery, development, regulation, and utilization. And I base the rest of the talk on those, these four pillars. So let's start first with discovery. Of our contemporary therapeutic armamentarium, a large number of them have originated from federal funding to academic centers. So for example, NIH funding has resulted in the discovery of 153 new FDA approved drugs over the years with new indications for current drugs as well. The same is true in Europe there is a, what's known as the European Healthcare 2020 Fund, which has been important in the development of new pharmaceutical agents in Europe. Some of the examples from NIH include Zidovudine or AZT, imatinib or Gleevec, hepatitis B, and the hepati the, uh, some of the herpes uh, vaccines. So this is an important um, route, if you like, of new drug development. But now the politics. In the proposed 2018 Trump budget, there is a proposal for an almost $6 billion cut to the NIH budget. It also requires that they fold AARHQ, AHRQ and the Fogarty Center into the NIH budget and eliminate those budgets. So in effect, this is going to be a close to a 20 to 25 percent cut if it in fact goes through. Now, the, the, the one element of hope I have is that when Trump, one of his very first presidential um, edicts was that the NIH should cut, NIH should cut uh, funding by $1.2 billion in 2017. Fortuitously, Congress refused the request and actually gave NIH $2 billion raise. So this may not go through, but it is nonetheless a worry, and it's also a worry in Europe that similar things will happen there. What about development? Well, first of all, we'll talk about it in terms of industry, and then we'll talk a little bit about pipeline, and again, the example I've chosen re relates back to yesterday's discussion. First of all, there's been extensive mergers and acquisitions within the pharmaceutical industry, which has reduced competition, and I would also argue has reduced the number of new drugs entering the market in the last few years. Um, in the U.S., within the last year, one company has purchased 15 of the generic manufacturers and immediately removed their products from the market. And that, of course, as you will see in a few minutes, has driven costs up dramatically. Secondly, the reputation of the, oh, sorry about that. 
The reputation of the pharmaceutical industry has taken a number of hits in the last few years. Uh, marketing for non-approved indications has been a huge one, and a number of the companies have actually had to pay very substantial fines as a consequence of this. Um, Drug shortages have been manipulated, and that's caused all kinds of problems. And it's been intentional in many instances. Not always. Sometimes there have been things like factory fires and so on. But some of the drug shortages have actually come about as a consequence of manipulation. And I'd also like to talk a little bit about the, the Canadian situation, because uh, we haven't done well in this area. I talked a bit about the pipeline, and one of the organizations that does forward forecasting is the National Institute for Clinical Evaluation in Britain. And they just did one a few months ago in terms of the new antibiotics about likely to be approved in the next five years. In other words, these are ones that are at the very end of their phase three testing or are already in the uh, regulatory pipeline. And there were 25 in total, of which 15 are for MRSA, VRE, six are for carbaminase producing enterobacteria, and four for C. difficile. But if you look at what these drugs are, 17 are derivatives of existing agents, four are for skin infections, and one is a topical for diabetic skin ulcers. And if you've done the arithmetic, you'll notice that's three new compounds not previously available to us. So the antibiotic situation that we discussed isn't as bright as we would all like it to be at the present time. What about the Canadian situation? Well, during the Mulroney era, the pharmaceutical companies were given a patent extension in return for which they were asked to um, contribute 10% of their sales to research and development in Canada. And in the year 2000, they did. They achieved 10% sales in research and development in Canada. By 2013, which is the last year I could find data, that had fallen to 4.4%. Now, our, in current legislation, the comparators for Canada are France, Germany, Italy, Sweden, Switzerland, the UK, and the US. And if you look carefully, you will see that of our comparator countries, we have the lowest percentage of sales reinvested in research and development in Canada. So the industry has not held up to their part of the bargain. What I find absolutely unique is in Switzerland, where they actually spend more on research and development than they retain in sales, which is quite incredible. Now let's talk about regulation, because that's in a state of tremendous flux at the present moment. And to do this, we need a little bit of history, some politics, the developing world, and the issue of counterfeit drugs. First of all, some legislation history. I'm using the US history um, primarily because it's the best documented. But in fact, drug re regulation has existed in Germany, for example, since the 1880s, and for opiates in the United States since the 19-teens. So drug regulation is not new by any means. In 1930, whoopsie, there I go again. In 1938, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act was uh, promulgated in the U.S. following a sulfonilamide disaster, and that required safety testing but not proof of efficacy. In 1962, following the thalidomide disaster, they then incorporated efficacy and close monitoring of all stages of drug development. And then on December 16, 2016, Barack Obama signed into effect the 21st Century Cures Act, probably the broadest and most sweeping change to the FDA that's occurred since 1962. Um, I won't there's a huge list of requirements that are included in this act, but one of the things is patient-focused drug development with patients incorporated into every panel that assesses drugs, modern trial design and evidence development, antimicrobial innovation and stewardship has been given to the FDA as a specific task, and regulation of stem cell therapies and also of medical devices, and a host of other requirements that have been added, together with a $500 million budget increase for the FDA to enable them to move forward with this. But there are problems with implementing this 21st Century Act because another one of, Dr. of President Trump's 
presidential edicts required a hiring freeze for all federal government departments, and there were in advance of that a thousand vacancies already in the FDA, and there will be no opportunity to hire staff to implement this new act. Um, secondly, the European Medicines Agency, which in, to my mind is probably the best regulatory agency in the world at the present moment in the sense of the authority that they have to impose particular requirements on the pharmaceutical industry and in terms of the nature of the evaluations that they do on medications. But they're currently located in London and they are the first victim of Brexit. They are in the process of leaving London and in fact, in November of this year, the new site will be uh, announced. Uh, there are six cities in the running, and the two front runners are Milan and Bratislava. There are reasons for both of them, uh, so it's hard to know which one will be chosen. But this is going to have a big impact, first of all, on drug regulatory authority in Britain. They're going to have to develop a whole new one because they've been part of this one for the last 50 years. Secondly, the efficacy, safety, and quality of medicines in the UK will no longer be subject to the EMA regulatory framework. And thirdly, the pharmaceutical industry is reassessing its commitment to the UK health scene, and a number of companies have already pulled out of Britain, and there will be more in the next year, I would imagine. Finally, let's talk about Health Canada. That tends to follow the FDA and EMA. Canada is a non-voting member of the International Consortium for Harmonization, which means that they follow and incorporate whatever is done in the international environment, but a little bit later. And one of the concerns that most people have with Health Canada is they're not very transparent in comparison to the FDA and EMA. Just to give you a quick overview so you understand how these various things compare, in Canada, regulation occurs by Health Canada, we are unique in one sense in that we have a very specific mechanism for pricing drugs when they enter the Canadian market. If they're patented drugs, it's the Patent and Medicine Prices Review Board. And if they're generic drugs, it's done by the payers, either the provinces or the third parties who pay for them. Formulary evaluation, in order to cut down the necessity to do these things over and over again, is performed by CADETH for nine of the provinces. Quebec does not participate in this process. And then there's now uh, fairly unique in, uh, groups who do the evaluation for third-party payers. I was part of one of those groups for a number of years. And just for those of you who are not familiar with CADETH, there's a table outside, and they have a really interesting prescriber's resource list. And the other thing I would tell you about CADETH is that the committee that uh, does the evaluation at CADETH is chaired by one of our own, Lindsay Nicole. In the U.S., regulation is done by the FDA. Pricing is negotiated by agency, and I'll show you in a minute impact of that. And in the U.K., regulation until now has been done by the European Medicines Agency, pricing by the National Health System, and evaluation by the group that I spoke of a few minutes ago, the National Institute for Clinical Evaluation. And I have to say their reports are some of the neatest things to read. What about the developing world? Well, this is how drugs are sold in Haiti. There is no regulatory authority, and as far as I could determine, there are no pharmacies. Drugs are sold by street vendors with little or no education. They purchase the drugs from a variety of sources, uh, expired drugs from North America, counterfeit drugs <laughs> on the market, drugs from China, a variety of different sources, and the patient simply walks up and asks for them, and you can see the scissors at the top, the the vendor just simply cuts them off. So, what about other lower middle income countries? In Nigeria, there are 200,000 unofficial drug shops and 2,600 licensed pharmacists. And because we would not be able to get drugs to the population without the drug shops, they are fully accepted by the Nigerian government. So drug shops are lower tier retail outlets with no pharmacist on staff. The United States Agency for International Development has just completed a study in 32 lower middle income countries and found that there are 17 countries that allow over-the-counter sales of drugs without supervision by a pharmacist. So when we were talking yesterday about antibiotics and Mark Sprenger showed you those pictures of what he had seen in India, that's not unique to India. 
That's widespread in the developing world. There is good news. The countries that have drug shops actually have seen a decline in childhood malaria. What about substandard and falsified products? And I know you can't really see it, but I only selected this to include simply because the top two, this is anti-infectives and this is anti-parasitic uh, uh, products. These are, the WHO garners the reports throughout the world of substandard or counterfeit products and maintains a registry, and this is the registry for 2016. So the major category of substandard product or, uh, or counterfeit products are anti-infective agents. Just to add to what you learned yesterday. Let's look at utilization. Um, and under that category, we're going to talk about knowledge, costs, and unintended consequences. Um, about 20 years ago, the General Medical Council in Britain did a survey of graduating medical school, uh, graduating medical students at four universities, two traditional, Oxford and Cambridge, and two new medical schools with new curriculums within the last 25 years. And what they discovered, much to their distress, was that graduating medical students felt they didn't know very much in the way of therapeutics and that they didn't have any confidence about prescribing. So that's been followed since then by much more rigorous scientific studies of the knowledge of graduating medical students in the area of therapeutics. And this one just came out recently, and it incorporated the European Union because there is complete mobility of health professionals within the European Union. So it's important to find out where the weak spots are, if you like. And what they learned when they did this, which was uh, knowledge, skills, and attitudes towards therapeutics, and I've masses of data, so I've summarized it, and I hope I haven't un unduly simplified it, but they found that the graduating students had poor knowledge of drug interactions and contraindications, chose inappropriate therapy for common diseases, and made prescribing errors, such as potentially harmful or lethal therapy, about 10% of the time. So that's the first evaluation we have of how capable, competent, and confident our graduating students are to actually write prescriptions. What about health professionals who are already in practice? Well, first of all, this area has expanded so dramatically, the area of therapeutics over the last few years, that it would be impossible for many people to stay up to date. So fortuitously, um, again, a Canadian initiative that I want to laud. Uh, Cadeth has seized this and commissioned Jeremy Grimshaw at the University of Ottawa, also a fellow of the Academy, to develop something called the Rx for Change database. And this is just a screenshot of the Cadeth um, website. The Rx for Change database is a, mech is a, a, a very scientific overview of all of the processes that can be used to continue to educate practitioners, to change behaviors, to do a variety of different things that are important to an understanding of continuing education. So I, I, you can see that there's the sponsors of the database have been CIHR, KT Canada, um, sorry, I can't read this one, uh, and the Cochrane collaboration, both the Canadian version as well as the uh, international version. Let's talk a little bit about costs because that's really the iceberg that we haven't really addressed very well. As Tom mentioned, drugs are expensive. They constitute, in 2016, from CHI-HI data, 16% of total health costs, which is actually greater than physician services costs. But if you look at what's happening, and I raised the issue a few minutes ago about the purchase of the generic drug manufacturers in the US, um, for 30 pills at the present time, from four different sources, and I've picked out the most egregious examples, but they're, they're important ones, I think. GoodRx is a wholesaler that sells to the chain drugstores in the United States. This is the national agency drug acquisition costs, and that's for Medicare, Medicaid, and the VA system. This is in the province of Saskatchewan and the province of Ontario. Look at the cost of tetracycline almost $900 from the wholesaler for 30 pills. The agencies, the VA, et cetera, can get it for $255 for 30 pills. In Saskatchewan and Ontario, you can get it for $3. Can you explain that? 
I can't. Doxycycline, not quite as dramatic, but also present. Captopril, again, not quite as dramatic, but again, a variation. And that was the only one I could find where Saskatchewan and Ontario had different costs. So let's talk about high-cost drugs in Canada <clears throat> since 2005. The dark blue represent the drugs that are $50,000 a year or more. The light blue represent those that are between twenty dollars and $50,000 a year. And the light green are those that are between $10,000 and $20,000 a year. Now I'm going to take you back to our patient. She was on Harvoni. Harvoni was introduced, oh sorry. Harvoni was introduced in the dark blue category. Her infliximab was introduced in the light blue category. Fortunately, her azathioprine and codeine didn't even make it into this graph because they were down here somewhere. Now, fortuitously, the provinces actually cooperated and negotiated with Gilead and drove the price of Hardoni, Harvoni down into the light blue category. Infliximab now has biosimilars, and we won't get into that because that's a whole new topic all in itself, but the biosimilars have driven the cost of infliximab into the light green category. But if you've done the arithmetic, you'll notice that this lady's treatment at the beginning of her therapy was probably in the vicinity of $90,000 a year. And just last year, we had a new drug added to the armamentarium in Canada, for a very rare disease, fortuitously, in which the opening cost for one year of therapy will be $1,054,000. Can we afford that? I don't know. So how do we compare with our comparator countries? Now, um, you can see Canada is set here in, in the center. There are two countries amongst our comparators that charge a little bit more, Germany, and the one that drives us way up, because the legislation requires that a patented drug enter the Canadian market at the median of our comparator countries, is the U.S., where prices are just completely out of sight in comparison to Canada, whether for patented drugs or for generic drugs. How do we compare with the rest of the OECD countries? Well, this is for the last slide was. 2014, this is for 2015, I couldn't find one for 2014, um, but the um, U.S. is way ahead of everyone else, you can see, in terms of the price ratios. Canada, uh, Mexico is number two and Canada is number three. What I'd like to focus on is Australia, which I hope very much will be a comparator country. Um, Minister Philpott announced in, uh, in the spring that they were going to re-examine our comparators. They were also going to look at coordinating the activities amongst the Patent and Medicine Prices Review Board and CADETH and so on in order to streamline the process of evaluation. Um, whether that will continue now that she's moved on to another portfolio, I don't know. But it was a very uh, welcome suggestion when she made it. But I'd like to talk a little bit about Australia because I'd like to see that as one of our comparators. In 1998, they set up a program called NPS Medicine Wise as an independent organization. They introduced therapeutic behavioral changes, and guess where they got them? From CADF. So we have contributed to what's going on in Australia. Data-driven quality improvement reports and interventions are n a natural part of their programs. Consumer awareness campaigns, they advertise not just the pharmaceutical industry advertise on TV, they, the, the program itself advertises on TV. Decision support tools for health professionals and consumers, very rigorous uh, professional development programs. And they have recently done a very detailed economic analysis and found that the return on investment since 1998 is roughly $1.7 billion. So they, they have demonstrated that you can alter drug prescribing and you can reduce costs considerably, but it takes a lot of effort. It's not something that will happen overnight, and it's not something that will happen by wishful thinking. Let's finally talk about unintended consequences. Um, I think Marty has demonstrated very nicely the issues with the opioid epidemic as one example of an unintended consequences of our 
<coughs> therapies, antibiotic resistance we discussed yesterday, and then the unknown long-term safety issues, particularly with some of these newer drugs, the protein drugs that are coming on the market. We're now beginning to appreciate that there are side effects such as infections and even malignancies associated with them. So these are going to have to be monitored very closely. So the peril of our contemporary therapeutics, uh, if, if in fact um, academic research funding dries up or, or drops, where will new drugs come from? What will happen nationally and internationally regarding regulation of efficacy and safety? How can we improve therapeutic knowledge? Can we afford to treat everyone? And what are the unintended consequences of our therapies? I'd like to acknowledge people who've been very helpful in constructing this talk, Dick Wanchabaum at the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Kathleen Ewell, who's the Director of Office of Generic Drugs, who acquainted me with the U.S. situation um, and also suggested some of the perils that I've listed, and Dr. Mitch Levine, the Vice Chair of the Patent Medicine Prices Review Board. And I'd like to just end, and I have Paul's permission to do this, to pay tribute to uh, an an individual who's been very important in my professional life, a role model, a mentor extraordinaire who died three weeks ago. Bob Anderson was a individual whose wise counsel and guidance was invaluable, and I wouldn't be on the podium today without his input. Thank you. <laughs>